pray. Oh Lord, thank you for the wondrous mystery. It's such a glorious story tucked away in scripture. It's far more profound than we can even wrap our heads around. We'll see that somewhat today. It's an amazing story of your intent all along of what you were going to do when you created us and you had a plan in place and you carried that plan out to perfection. We, we, we might have thought we messed up your plan, but we didn't. We'll see that today. Lord, thank you for this Easter season when we, we just can celebrate that the cross was not the final word, but the empty tomb was. You came out of that empty tomb and you said, yeah, I'm, I'm alive, I'm back. And what that means to us today, every day, to get up with that hope, that hope of, of resurrection, that you have resurrected yourself into us, into our spirit. You've made us alive in you and you are alive in us. It's a great mystery. That's a wondrous mystery. God, I want to lift just a couple people up today and just want to continually pray for uh, Melinda's family and Trent uh, that has passed away and his wife that has left behind and such a young age, so we just lift them up to you today. Pray you'll continually pour your grace into their lives. And there are so many others that have lost loved ones in the last couple of months and last two, three, four months, and we just continually lift them up, that they would just continually find their strength and their hope, their resolve in you every day, that the hope of resurrection would constantly go before them to know that this world is, is not the end. We have a home waiting us when we leave here. So I just lift up all those families as well today. And for anyone today, Lord, that's got an unspoken request, anybody today that just has a a burden they're carrying that they haven't been able to share with anybody, you know, we all sit here and we all, uh, there's the person we let everybody see and then there's the person that we live with inside sometimes and the things we hold and the hurts that we carry. It's so great to know that at the cross you identified with us, you know what we're going through in in a way that we don't even understand. But Lord, I just pray for everyone in this room today that you would speak to their spirits, their souls, their hearts today. You would just encourage them through the words that are spoken, that we would hear what it is we need to hear this morning from your spirit so we can go out and uh, we we can just show your glory in the week ahead in all that we say and do. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness. We praise your name for that, that you are faithful to us every day, whether it's as a church body, whether it's as families, you do provide for our needs. And um, we eat our meals and we're in our warm houses and we go to our jobs and you provide for us and we say thank you for that. We leave our gifts today and say thank you for that as well. And now, Lord, open up our hearts and our minds and our spirits to your word. Speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Back to the future. We're going to start this new series today, and I mentioned that a moment ago. You know, um, honestly, as I was studying yesterday, I got really kind of wound up in that one song we were singing, you know, singing, singing, that glorious day. And, uh, and I thought, where did that come from? And it actually, that kind of happened yesterday when I was studying. I was like seeing some things and I just got really moved because there, there was a part of me that the last two Sundays, I wanted the last two Sundays to be a part of the series and I ac- actually was just a little bit timid to say I'm going to do this series because I thought, well, I don't really know what it's going to look like. And, and then when I took this message on for Sunday, I thought, boy, I don't know how this is going to come out. And yesterday... God just really showed me some things that maybe they won't move you in the same way, but I sat at my computer and I got pretty emotional and pretty moved, pretty powerful stuff. A couple weeks ago, meeting with the youth and we had this game, we were playing Would You Rather. We had this phenomenal, if you ever played Would You Rather, you know how that is. Um, And so we had this phenomenal question come up. Would you rather, in fact, I've got to get to clicking here because it's on the screen. Would you rather travel back in time and meet your ancestors or go forward in time and meet your descendants? Now, there's a loaded would you rather, right? You know, it's like, and you've seen those shows on TV where people go back and trace their genealogy roots and you get the celebrity on TV that's like really embarrassed and ashamed of their past. It's like, uh, and... um, or, but just think, imagine going forward and meeting your descendants, you know, in a couple of generations and the way the world's going, you'd be like, whoa, no, oh, that might not give you a lot of hope either. So interesting question, and it's a great question to lead us into this series. 
Back to the Future. As I said, don't expect a lot of movie illustrations. Probably won't get any movie illustrations. Probably won't get a lot of movie clips. Um, uh, but but the, the theme of this series, the idea of this series, is the idea of going back into the Old Testament to find our future in the cross and beyond. And, and that's the reality. We can start with this verse in Revelations 13, 8. All who dwell on the earth will worship the beast whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. Another translation, the Lamb who was slain or the Lamb who was slaughtered before the creation of the world. And there are two ways this is translated. I think this is the best translation, that the Lamb was slain before the foundation of the world. And it puts the emphasis on the Lamb being slain from before God even began to create things here on the earth. And I think that is a reality. We'll see that really, I think, unfold here in the book of Genesis this morning as we look at this story. And we look at that and we wonder, well, how can that be? How can he be slain before God even started the world? And I know that's a question that goes a little bit beyond our comprehension. But maybe to some degree we'll understand it this morning a little bit more. You know, when you think of that, you know, you you think of those movies. I'm sure most of us have watched the Back to the Future movies. And um, yeah, they, 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 weren't the, they weren't the most G-rated movies, but um, they're pretty iconic in our history, and there's three of them. And um, so just thinking about that reality, you know, they made this idea of being able to travel in time kind of believable. Like you could really go back in time. And, and, um, but it is believable. When you look at the scripture, it is actually believable that we can go back into the Old Testament and we can learn things that were going to happen hundreds of years in the future, things that uh, really undergird our hope and, and our faith today. We'll see that, hopefully, throughout this series. Here's the big idea for this series, finding the hope of the future in the stories of the past. So we'll cling on that every week, kind of the tagline. Finding the hope of the future in the wonderful stories of the past. And we kind of saw this last Sunday, right? Remember on the road to Emmaus, Jesus runs into these two men and, and Jesus has this conversation and he said to them, oh foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets he interpreted to them in the scriptures, all the things concerning himself. It's an amazing thing. And here they are heartbroken and he comes along and what he does is he begins to take the Old Testament and he used the Old Testament to explain the crucifixion, support the resurrection, and to build up their faith of these heartbroken individuals who thought they had lost all hope. So he's going to begin to unpack the story of Abraham and Isaac, the story of Moses and the Red Sea, Joseph and his life in Egypt, Ruth and the kinsman redeemer, David and his epic battle with Goliath, Daniel and his night in the lion's den, all of those things he will unpack for them. And he'll go to Isaiah and the Psalms and unpack all this to say this is what happened. Be hopeful. And I love this this next verse here that after he reveals himself to them and then they realize, oh, this is Jesus. He really is back. And then he vanishes and I love this line. Then they said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? Maybe that's what I experienced yesterday. Just this this, this sensation of, wow, this is really amazing. The things that God is showing me and are coming alive in me. And the scriptures can do that. If you're not saved, the scriptures can convict your heart of your need for a a savior and lead you to salvation. And if you are saved, the scriptures can, can just come alive in you as they're illuminated by the Holy Spirit and you can just be so moved by what you read and what you learn. They can stir a passion up within you. I think we sense that every week as we sit back there and discuss in our Sunday school class the wonders of of God. We've been going through his name and it just kind of does that to us. Today, and, and I guess my hope through this series is that will happen, that the scriptures will burn in us as we find Christ throughout the Old Testament. Today, we're going to begin in the beginning. Now, we're not going to necessarily take this chronologically. I don't even know where we're going to go next week yet, but I just felt led to start with the very first story uh, with Adam and show us that the entire Bible from the very beginning has always been totally about Adam, entirely about, I mean, entirely about Jesus. And we see in the story of Adam that the the entire Bible is always about Christ. It is his book. And we're going to see that 
as we go through this series. Today, the message today then is an intentionally relational God. An intentionally relational God. And there's that verse again, all who dwell on the earth will worship him, the beast, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. And we see God's intention there right from the beginning and his, his desire for a relationship, that he was going to come and make things right before he ever created anything. And we look at that and yeah, we have a tough time understanding how that can be. But that is the reality. Here's today's big idea. This is the big idea for today's message specifically. The intentional and relational God finished before he started. That's so awesome. I just love that. The intentional and relational God finished before he started. And I just think that we're going to see that today and I think in ways that are just like, I don't know if I ever saw that before. And it's really awesome. So here it is, and we just know that when Christ hung on the cross, that one of the last things he said before he died, before he gave up the spirit was, it is finished. And here we see the lamb was slain before the foundation of the world, so it was finished before God even got started. Before you were even a thought in his mind, I think God had it all worked out. And again, we say, what does that mean and how can that be possible? And all we can say is that's a God equation. That's the kind of thing God can do. And um, so we start there. Again, we're looking at Adam and Eve then today in the book of Genesis and specifically this idea that Adam is a type of Christ. Here's the verses in Romans 5 and uh, Kevin read this earlier. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin and so death spread to all men because all sinned and then down to verse 14, yet death reigned from Adam to Moses even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam who was a type of the one who was to come. And Adam was a type of Christ. Uh, he was a type of the one who was going to come, a type of Jesus. Um, and we'll see that even more today. In fact, the Bible refers to them in this way. The Bible says that Adam was the, Adam was the, first, or Adam was the first Adam. And it refers to Jesus as the last Adam or the second Adam. So you see that in Scripture in a couple of places. We have the first Adam, the Adam in the garden, uh, the first man created, and then we have the last Adam, which is Jesus, and he is the second Adam. And we'll see throughout the series. And what you find is you find several parallelistic comparisons and contrasts between Adam and Jesus. Now, I'm not going to sit up here and just give you a list of all these. Uh, we're going to kind of tell a story today. I think today's message might feel more like a story, and we're going to kind of tell the story here, and throughout it, we're going to intersperse it with some of these parallels that we see between Adam and and Jesus. And so we have this story, and this story has really two sections to the story, or two halves. We'll take the first half, then we'll take the second half. And here's the amazing thing both of these halves of the story relate to the two trees that are in the Garden of Eden. And I've talked about these two trees a lot, right? There's the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and they represent how we can approach life every day, either through Christ or through the flesh and through rules and through religion and that's not necessarily what we're going to talk about today as we look at these two trees. We're going to see them a little, a little differently today but kind of in, in a similar fashion. But both of these halves relate to that. So a story in two parts. The tree of life and that's a relational God and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is an intentional God and I think it's going to be really powerful to unpack this today. So let's start with the first tree, the tree of life, a relational God and, um, and, and just think about this, this aspect of well, here's the question. Why did God create us? What, why, if I asked you, why did God create us? And I think most of us would say, well, he wanted a relationship with us. And that is true. On some level, that is true that God did. He is a relational God. But you, know, you understand that he didn't need us. The Father, Son, and Spirit were in perfect harmony. They had perfect fellowship. He didn't need us, but he wanted us. It's pretty powerful. So he wanted us. He created us because he wanted us, but... But again, why did God create us? And I think God created us for a, a couple of reasons that we can identify, and they both relate to the two, the two core realities of his essence, the core realities of, of who God is. He's two things. He is love, as in goodness, and he is light, as in glory. That's who God is. Those two things stand apart. You need nothing else to, to identify God uh, when it comes to those two things, those two qualities. He is goodness. He is glory. He is love. He is light. And so, why did God create us? First, he created us, and there's the question, why did God create us? Um, but here it is, God created us as an expression of his glory. God created you and me to be an expression of his glory. That was the whole 
one of the whole purposes. And it, maybe it will help us understand it. This might be a weak illustration, but imagine this. Imagine you know somebody who likes to sing. In fact, they don't just like to sing. They have to sing so people can hear. They have to perform. It's in their blood. They have to be on American Idol, and they have, to, they have to sing for people to hear. Or you have that person that's an artist, so they just have to create things or paint pictures, and they just have to show the world, hey, look at this beautiful creation that I painted. Or that chef that is like an artist, right, that makes these amazing dishes, and people have to try them and have to respond to them, and it's in their blood. And we've all got things like that to some degree because we were created in God's image. And I'm just saying that God is this God of immense glory, and God just wanted to express his glory. And he chose you and me to be what? The pinnacles of his glory. Now ironically, keep this thought in mind, who was the original pinnacle of his glory? Satan. And we know how that turned out. And then we became the pinnacle of God's glory. And so look at this over here in Psalms chapter Psalms chapter 8. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him? And the son of man that you care for him. You, yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. Speaking of you and me. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. Adam and Eve in the garden. Given dominion over every creature. All sheep and oxen and also the beasts of the field. All the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea. Whatever passes along the paths of the seas. And so Adam and Eve were created and crowned with the glory of God. They radiated the very glory of God. It's a, it's a profound thing to stop and to think about. They ra- radiated the glory of God. And that's why it says this over in Genesis 2.25, and the man and his wife were both naked and they were not ashamed. Why were they not ashamed? Because they radiated with the glory of God. They just radiated with his glory. And so it's like they were clothed with God's glory. And that's pretty, pretty powerful to stop and think about. Now at the same time, when they sin, what happens? They immediately cover themselves up and they run for more cover. They hide from God because now, well, now we're no longer, now we're, no, we know we're naked now. We're exposed. We've lost the glory of God. And that adds a little bit of weight to this verse over in Romans 3, 23. We know this by heart probably. For all have sinned and fall sh- fallen short of the glory of God. When they sinned, they fell short of the, they lost the glory of God. They are now, they're exposed. And can you just imagine how that would have felt for Adam and Eve the moment that all of a sudden the glory of God left them and they are exposed? And can you imagine the moment that Christ is hanging on the tree, tree and he is, from all what I've understood, he ended up basically naked on the tree, exposed. How do you think that felt? for the God of the universe in that moment. And we see here a couple of types. We'll see a few of these throughout the service today. The first Adam was crowned with with the glory and honor of God. And then after sinning was left naked and ashamed, the last Adam, Jesus, was crowned with the glory and honor of God, yet taking on our sin, he was crucified in nakedness and shame. You see the type just emerges out of the story. It's a beautiful thing here. Now, here's the reality. The fact of the matter is, we have lost that outward glory, true. But today, when we become a new creation in Christ, what happens? We are a temple in here. The glory of God is in here. That's why people can see Christ radiate from our lives. They can see Christ in our eyes. Christ be all around me, above and below me, before and behind me. He just radiates from us because Christ is within us. And so there is that hope we have today, even though we don't radiate from radiate Him on the, the outside physically. Here's the second reason God created us and God created us to experience his goodness. To experience his goodness. See, God is glory, but he's also goodness. He's he's love. He's a loving God. And he, he, he just created us so he could pour his goodness out. It's like he had all this goodness. He just wanted to pour it out on somebody. The angels kind of wrecked things for him to some degree and so now he's gonna start with the human race and create us in his image. Psalm 145, 8, the Lord is good to all and his mercy is over all that he has made. Lord is, when it comes to being good and loving his creation, he is, he loves us all equally and impartially. He just does. Yes, there's a special love for those that are his children, but in general, he just loves his creation. Matthew 5, uh, 45, for he makes 
his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust for if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? That's, that's God's attitude. If you only love the ones who love you, what reward do you have? God loves everybody. The sun is shining today on those who know him and on those who don't. And the rain will fall and grow their harvest just like it will grow our harvest. God created us so that we could experience his goodness, that he could pour out his goodness on us. Now just stop for a a moment on this reality and consider what does that do to your whole existence to, to understand how you were created and why you were created. That God created you to express his glory and God created you to just receive his goodness. How loved are you? How wanted are you? How valuable are you? And he created you in his image. I heard somebody say this week, there is no other creature that can write praise songs to God. But we can. They may be singing their own way, but we maybe don't know what they're singing, but we can write and speak songs to God in a way no other creature can. We were created in his image. Now, here's the thing. We, 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 we believe all that. Yeah, that's great, but there's this big but. There's this big but. Yeah, but Adam sinned. But we still sin today, and it's like we somehow have overwritten God's narrative. This amazing, we've overwritten it. We've blown it. And that's not true. We can today express the glory of God. We can know the ultimate goodness of God. It's kind of like there's two forces in this room. There's, there is our sin, but there's God's grace, and it's, God's grace is just greater, and it just consumes the evil and the wickedness and the sinfulness. Romans 5, therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. There's a type. For as by one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Verse 20, now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. That no matter how big of a sinner we can be, God's grace is so much far greater. And it will consume sin. And it does that, and we see that, those types. One trespass sin leads to condemnation for all. One righteous act leads to, or is the path to, justification in life for all men. It's not that all men are saved, but all men can be saved through the one righteous act of Christ. The first Adam disobeyed, and we all became sinners. The last Adam, Jesus obeyed, and many will become righteous who put their faith and their trust in Christ. One commentator said it this way, it's like, it's like Jesus and Adam are two representatives, and And so Adam represents all those lost in their sins and Jesus represents all those saved by his righteous glory. So, here's the reality. We we can all become new creations and God's grace can rewrite the narrative of Adam's sin in our life and we can express his glory. Romans 6, 11, just know that God's grace is greater than our sin in Romans 6, 11. You should know this verse by heart. So you must, you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Consider yourselves dead to sin. His grace is far greater than your sin. So that's the relational God first half. Here's the second half of the story, a story in two parts. And this is the intentional God we see over here. And this is what's so fascinating is we see this intentional God emerge from this tree. We define it as the knowledge, tree of knowledge of good and evil. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which we know that tree in several ways. It's like the tree of, of uh, you know, shame and, and, and the tree of death and the tree of, that tree reminds me of when Jesus said, uh, or when the proverb says, there's a way that seems right to man and in the end it leads to death. And I think of this tree. It just seems like that's the right tree, the, the right and wrong. Do the right thing over the wrong thing. Be religious, follow the rules, all those kinds of things. Or live through your flesh, trust yourself. And all of that is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And um, it is not a good thing. Now, think about this. We've talked about this tree. One thing about this tree, realize this is not a bad tree. And it's not necessarily an ugly tree. God created this tree. So it, had, it was probably a beautiful tree. This tree was not a tempting tree. This tree didn't tempt Adam and Eve. God can't tempt us. God won't tempt us. Because he can't. But he put this tree in there and he basically said you need to avoid this tree. Now, they were tempted by Satan used this tree to tempt them and to draw them over and say, look at this fruit, you should try this. But they weren't tempted on their own from the tree. 
pretty amazing. But as we look at this tree, we'll see some surprising truths emerge and some fascinating pictures. So here, here's three intentional things we're going to see as we look at, look at this this morning. First, God always intended to redeem us. God always intended to redeem us. The, 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 the God that finished before he started always intended to redeem us. That was always his intent. And he was going to do that. And I think it's pretty fascinating. So we see that the redemptive plan is not reactionary. It's deliberate and it's intentional. The lamb that was slain from the foundations of the world. This was always his intent. Now how do we define this tree? Well, let me define it for you this way. We often think of this tree here. It's a choice, right? Man was given a choice. A free will choice in the Garden of Eden. And it was a choice, but I think it's far more than a choice. Because I think even more represented God's authority. This was God, as long as they respected God's authority, things would be fine. And we know in our life and throughout the Bible what it's like when we reject God's authority. It can destroy us. It can destroy our, our, our relationships and our finances and our health and all kinds of things. We need to live under God's authority. And ultimately, I believe, we're going to see this tree was a necessity. That when God put this tree in the garden, it was a necessity. And I'll explain why that is. I've talked about this a couple years back, and even this week, I saw it more clearly. But here's the, the point. Are we to believe that if God didn't put this tree in the garden, that Adam and Eve couldn't have made a choice? Honestly? I mean, Satan made a choice. We don't know much about his story, but he just wanted to sit on God's throne. And, and uh, Can you see a scenario like this? Remember when Adam and Eve sinned, and they put the angel there, and the, 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 the sword, you know, the flaming sword to keep them out, right? That's afterward. Was there anything keeping Adam and Eve in the garden. Can you see a scenario where the serpent someday takes Eve and says, look out there. And this guy's got you trapped in here. Look out there. You don't need him. You don't. Kind of the same lie that he fed himself, that he can be like God, he can be his own God. And, and he didn't need that tree to convince them that they could be their own God and go their own way and do their own thing. So why was the tree in the garden? Well, I think it was a necessity. God put it there deliberately. And we'll see why. Because I think God knew that we would violate it. And he knew that we needed to violate it. God wanted a relationship with us. And in, on some level, it's like, they're, they're going to need to violate this tree. Because the pinnacle of my salvation before was Lucifer. I didn't have a redemptive plan for Lucifer, and I've lost him. I have a redemptive plan for Adam and Eve. So that when they go their own way and try to be their own God, I can redeem them. Pretty powerful. You see, God wants a relationship with us. He's God, he creates us as his, he wants a relationship with us that is gonna require things that we can't even comprehend. Let me explain it to you like this. Remember the night Jesus is arrested. Jesus goes to Peter and says, Peter, tonight you are going to deny me and disown me three times. Peter's like, oh, yeah, sure, no, not me. You know, the obnoxious Peter, oh, I'm not going to do that. And then Peter goes out and does that, does he not? He goes out and he denies and he disowns God. And it was a tough night for Peter, a tough three days for Peter. It crushed him. And, but here's what Jesus told him that night. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. So here's the reality. Satan came to God. You know, this is just like when he went to Job. And he said, you know that guy Job, you think Job is so faithful and so, yeah, let me test him. Let me have him. And he said, okay. And Job took everything, or Satan took everything Job had and for the most part, Job remained faithful. Didn't respond perfectly, but we would say he remained faithful and passed the test, we would say. The same thing's going on with Peter and Satan just wants to sift Peter. You think he's a rock? You think you're going to build your church on him? You let me have him. You let me have him. Now, how many would say that Peter failed the test? How many would say that Peter passed the test? I think if you ask Jesus, he would say he passed the test. Because you know what Peter did? Peter got back up when he fell. He got back up and he's like, okay, yeah. And it humbled Peter. And it changed Peter. And the Peter that we see in the book of Acts is different because why? Because he fell. Because he got knocked down a few notches. And God came to him in this incredible grace and it just wrecked Peter's life. And Peter ended up 
You know why Peter, you know why Peter disowned Christ that night, right? He didn't want to be put on a tree and crucified like Jesus. And that's how he ends up dying because he was so changed. He was so radically changed. And we come to the Garden of Eden and my point is I think on some level this is kind of the same thing going on with humanity. God knew he would violate this tree and he put the tree there and he let the serpent get in there knowing the serpent would test us and we'd lose the test and yet we needed to lose the test to have the kind of relationship with God that we have because we could have easily just done like Satan and gone off on our own eventually. Hey, we were the pinnacle of his creation. This is kind of fascinating to, to kind of see the comparison there that Satan was allowed to test Adam just as he had Peter and Job. It doesn't say it exactly the same way, but God let that serpent in the garden. He let him in there. He let him test Adam and Eve. So we see this. We see this reality. We see a couple other things there in the garden. We see the promise here, uh, the promise of redemption here. The Lord God said to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and this woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. And so we just see there the promise that one day this Redeemer will come. We see it way back in Genesis chapter 3. And then we see the picture of redemption. The man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. And God comes into that garden. And, and the mother of all living is going to watch one of those living things lose its life and its blood's going to be poured out for their sins. First sacrifice. And then he takes those skins and as a picture in the Old Testament, he clothed them in their righteousness. Today, we're not just clothed in God's righteousness. We are new creations in Christ. That's a different paradigm today in the new from the old. But, but that was often used in Scripture. Clothes were often used as a picture of being clothed in the righteousness of God. Some more types emerge here. The first Adam required the first sacrifice, and Christ himself offered it. The last Adam, Jesus, was the very last sacrifice. I just love that picture. First sacrifice, last sacrifice. Jesus offers them both. And in the end, he is the last sacrifice. The first Adam substituted himself for God at the cross. God substituted himself for Adam. How beautiful, how amazing, how wonderful it is. And we see here the God that always intended to redeem us. He's an intentional God. The God of the intentional and relational God finished before he started. Always intended to redeem us. Had it all worked out. And that leads us to the second snapshot today. God always intended to reveal himself to us. And it just gets better as we go through this today. God always wanted us to know him. Think about that. He's a relational God. So God always wanted you and me to know him. He wanted Adam and Eve to know him. So just think about that. Here's another great passage. 1 Corinthians 15. Thus it is written. The first man, Adam, became a living being. And just listen for all the types in here as we read this. The first man, Adam, became a living being. The last, Adam, became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural, and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Just as we have born the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. Oh, wonderful types in there. And the reality is, is, that, is that God wanted Adam to know him. He wants us to know him and he's showing us who he is through Adam in these great parallelistic comparisons and contrasts. Here's a bunch more types that we see just between the two of them. The first Adam was, this isn't in the passage, these are just general. The first man, Adam, was made in the image of God. The last Adam, Jesus, is the express image of his father. The first Adam, tempted by the serpent in the garden. The last Adam, Jesus, was tempted by the serpent in the garden. The, the first Adam turned away from God in a garden. The last Adam, Jesus, turned to God in a garden. The first Adam sinned at the tree. The last Adam, Jesus, took our sin on the tree. And the first Adam lost the tree of life. The last Adam, Jesus, is the tree of life. Whoa, isn't that great stuff? And it's all right there in the very first chapters of the Bible. It's all about Christ. It's all about who he is and about his sacrifice. But here's what I want us to consider. I want us to consider for a moment, how did Jesus reveal himself to Adam? Genesis 3, and they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. 
But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Just note this insight here is that Jesus, Christ had these, these daily conversations with Adam and Eve in the garden. He was a theophany. It was, he would come down physically and walk with them and most commentators believe the language here is just this was an ongoing thing that every day he just kind of came down and they, they were almost like expecting him to come down. They heard him again, coming once again to fellowship with them. And I just stopped this week and I thought, I wonder what those, wonder what those walks and those talks would have been like. Oh, wouldn't that be great to be able to eavesdrop in? Here's Adam and Eve. You think they know God? You think they know their creator? It's like, you created me. Wow. Wow. Who am I? What am I? I mean, seriously, think of Adam and Eve. What am I? What's that? Oh, I get to name that, okay. And I got to name all these animals and, and then who am I? And just, just an amazing, just, just amazing to stop and think about what these walks and talks would be like and how as they spent time with God, they would get to know who God is and they would get to know who they were. Isn't that how it works for us every day? We crack open our Bible and devotion and we read and study and pray and meditate and we learn who God is and we learn who we are even better than we knew ourselves before pretty powerful so this intentional god always intended to reveal himself to us now i noted a couple of commentaries this week that said that the sound there they heard the sound in the cool of the day say that that was thunder ah, i don't buy that ah, that'll make sense god's not scaring them into the trees god's coming after them to call them out of the trees so i don't think there's thunder there I think there's a tender compassion. It goes against the whole narrative of who God is. It really does. But it raises this question, how do you hear the voice of of God after the fall? How do you hear God's voice in the garden after the fall? What kind of voice do you hear? Adam and Eve! Get out here! What'd you do? (laughs) I mean, really, how do you hear his voice? Or it's like, Adam, Eve, where are you? Where'd you go? What's wrong? It's pretty fascinating to stop and think about how we hear the voice of God. I hear a tender, compassionate God, not chasing them into the trees, but calling them out of the trees. And they follow the normal trajectory here. They sin, and, and it brings about guilt and shame, which leads to fear and hiding. And God wants to break that trajectory, and God doesn't want us to respond that way. He wants us to know His grace is greater than our sin. He calls us out, out of the trees, and He will make things right. Pretty powerful. Here's fascinating. We don't often consider this. Do you know the first time? When when do you think the first time in the is the Bible tells us that God is angry? Anybody have a guess? When do you think the first time is the Bible says God is angry? Well, it's fascinating because because somebody have a guess? Okay. Good Bible student there. See, fifteen hundred years in. 1,500 years in, God's down to his last righteous man and he calls Noah because he's going to wipe the world out with a flood. And the Bible says two things. He says he regretted that he made mankind. He didn't know how bad it was going to hurt. And he was tired of striving with man. The predominant emotion at the flood of, of Noah was not anger, it was sorrow. He was grieved in his heart. He was sad. Moses chapter, Exodus chapter four, Moses God sends him to Pharaoh and Moses has all those excuses. Oh, I, what about this and what about that? And finally God gets angry with him and says, you're going, <laughs> shut up, you can do it. It's the first time God gets angry in the Bible that we know of, it seems like. I could be wrong, I didn't read every chapter through, but I think that's the first time God shows anger. God is not an angry God. He's, he's, he's patient and long-suffering and we see that in the flood. We don't see him getting angry with Adam and Eve, we didn't even see him getting angry with the serpent. He just pronounces judgment. He, he puts Adam and Eve out of the garden to protect them. But we don't see him necessarily full of anger. So here's the thing, though. God wanted Adam and Eve to get to know him and you and me to get to know him. So how did he reveal himself to them? Well, through creation would be one way. And And yeah, through these walks and these talks in the garden is another way. What's another powerful way that God revealed himself and showed Adam and Eve who he really was? Through the fall, through the cross. Think about how much we would not know about God if we hadn't sinned, if we hadn't fallen, if God hadn't 
gone to that cross, how much we wouldn't know about God, about how he's long suffering and he's patient and he's merciful and he's gracious and he's everything we need in our relationships today. All we learn all of that through the fall, the intentional God who intended all along to redeem us and to reveal us, reveal himself to us and to reveal himself to us through the cross. It's just kind of mind-blowing when you stop and think about that reality. And you think about how they brought sin and a curse into the world and all these hardships that it stirs up in our life every single day, and yet it's how do we get to know Christ? Through the hardships, through the hard times. It's like we know God more intimately through the difficult times, and if those times had never been allowed to to happen, we wouldn't have been the people probably to have the relationship with God that we have today, and we certainly wouldn't know God the way we do. And at no point am I saying God tempted them to sin or God led them to sin. He didn't tempt Job or Peter to sin. But he knew we would sin and he knew we needed to sin. If we were going to have this kind of relationship, he just had to let us fall so he could pick us up and show us who he truly, truly was. And so God revealed himself more deeply through the fall and through the cross. I think that's just so amazing to consider. Today, the intentional and relational God finished before he started. He finished before he started. And that leads us to one last thing. God always intended to redeem us and to reveal himself to us and God always intended to identify with us. It gets even better. It's like, wow, God, the whole time, God intended to identify with us. We love to preach about finding our identity in Christ, but what about the reality where Christ identified with us? That in some sense, he found his identity in us. And the point is this, is that God always intended for deity to become humanity. He always intended for that from the get-go. I mean, he's here in the garden walking as a theophany, as a physical being before Adam and Eve and and saying, one day I'm going to come even more as a man. I'm going to set aside my divine privileges. I'm going to take on the fullness of humanity. I'm going to go to the cross. I'm going to be rejected and crucified to make things right because you're going to blow things in a couple days. You know, when it comes to the garden, here's a couple, three, I have three more types today as we wrap up. And so a couple things here. Um, who sinned first in this narrative when you go back to the Garden of Eden? We all know, right? Nothing against the women today, but here's what the Bible says. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. So Eve was the one who sinned. And it's kind of fascinating because we ask ourselves the question, Eve sinned and she would have probably been immediately naked and Adam's there. And so what led Adam to take that fruit and follow her in sin. There are different theories, but one theory is just the fact that he didn't want to leave her alone in her sin, that he joined her in that sin, that he wanted to identify with her, and he's like, you're going to be naked, I'm going to be naked. And he took the fruit, and he ate the fruit. And here's the problem, that's just, that was the wrong choice. It was, it was never his responsibility to try to save Eve in that way, or be, he couldn't be her redeemer. It was his job to what? Have dominion over the garden and keep that snake out of the garden. Should have been watching the front door maybe. But it wasn't his job to do what he did. But we see a type of Christ there do we not emerge. For uh, Eve sinned and Adam identified with her in that sin. And that's just the same thing as we sinned and Jesus goes to the cross and identified with us in our sin. See, it wasn't enough for Jesus just to identify with us as humans take on humanity. He had to identify with us in our sin and in death and in shame, and in guilt, and all those things. And he does exactly that. He does exactly that. Here's another, another type we should show here before we leave today. So the Lord God, First Tim, or this isn't First Timothy 2, this is Genesis 2. Got the wrong title there. Genesis 2, so the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept took one of his ribs and closed up the place with the flesh. Verse 22, and the rib that the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said that this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And we often think that that Eve came from, right, the the, the rib of Adam and, and he did. But there's more going on here if you look at it. I heard a commentator this week talking about this saying how it's like God did kind of like a surgery. Like he, he opened him up and took a rib out and, and he closed him back up with flesh. And, and, the, and the theory is maybe, just maybe, Adam had scars the rest of his life where that rib came out. Scars that, 
that showed how Eve came from him. And you see the parallel there, right? The type, Eve came from Adam, leaving him scarred for life, just as we come from Christ, as he is scarred for life. And, and Christ was what pierced in the side, right where Adam had that rib taken from him and his flesh opened and his flesh closed back up with more flesh. And there was probably was a scar there for life, identifying the two, how she came from him. And there will be eternal scars on Jesus forever. And we have come from him, right? Some even liken that to the church. The, the body of Christ actually comes from him in this sense. We are the body of Christ. We came from Christ. That's, that would be a whole other discussion. Pretty, pretty, pretty amazing. The point God always intended to identify with us, he always intended to take on our humanity, our sin, and join us in death, all so we could be identified with him, so we could take on his righteousness in life. And I have one final picture this morning. This picture shows the God who intended to redeem and reveal and identify with us. And it's found, if we look at that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the tree that's known as the tree of, you know, the flesh and the tree of death. There's a way that seems right, but it kills everything. And we're supposed to avoid that tree. And this is a most brilliant type. So think about that. Think of there's, there's two trees here in the garden. And, and look at what's going on here in the original Garden of Eden. It looks like this. The tree in the garden of the knowledge of good and evil. The tree that is the tree of death, shame and guilt and authority that we were told to avoid is the same tree while in the garden Jesus was told to and did embrace. He embraced that tree. Do you get the picture there? That here is Jesus. He is the tree of life. He is life. He is eternal life, abundant life. He is life. And he chose to leave and go over to the tree of death and identify with you and me to take on our guilt, to take on our shame and our brokenness and our emptiness and our hopelessness and our nakedness so we could travel from that tree back over here and be with him. And you see, God always intended to do that. He always intended to do that. And what he did, think about this, when he went over to this tree over here, and you know what he did over here? when he, di- he took this tree by its roots and ripped it out of the ground. That tree is dead. Death is dead. Shame is dead. Guilt is dead. The power of sin is dead. Now the tree is laying there and it's in the process of dying. You know what it is. You, you pull a shrub out and for a week or two it might have some bushes and some leaves and it's in the process of dying because it got cut off from its life source. It's like the war is over, right? The war is over, but we're still battling. We'll be battling until Christ comes back, but the war is over. Satan is still fighting, but the war is over. And the, and the tree has been killed. We don't need to live there. We don't need to live off that fruit. We can find, in fact, if we have trusted Christ as our Savior, our identity is fully in Christ. The intentional and relational God finished before he ever started. How amazing is that? God always intended to redeem us. God always intended to reveal himself to us. And God always intended to identify with us. Let me leave you with this last story. In Searching for God Knows What, Donald Miller tells of a lecture delivered to students at a Christian college. He began by telling them that he was going to present the gospel but leave out one very important element. He described the rampant sin that plagued our culture. Homosexuality, abortion, drug use, song lyrics on the radio, newspaper headlines, and so on. He said that the wages of sin is death, talked about teen pregnancy, sexually transmitted diseases, and all the supporting statistics. He described how the way sin separates us from God. He spoke of the beauty of of morality, telling stories, citing examples of how righteous living was better. He detailed greatness, the greatness of heaven. He spoke of repentance and how their lives could be God-honoring and God-centered. Describing what happened when he finished the lecture, Miller writes, I rested my case and I asked the class if they could tell me what it was I had left out of the gospel presentation. Not a single hand was raised. I presented a gospel to to a Christian Bible college students and left out Jesus and nobody noticed. He left out Jesus and the cross, nobody noticed. To a culture that believes they go to heaven based on whether or not they're morally pure or that they understand some theological ideas or that they are very spiritual, Jesus is completely unnecessary. At best, he is an afterthought, a technicality by which we become morally pure or a subject of which we know or a founding father of our woo-woo spirituality. 
Whoa. Yet what we see in the earliest pages of the Bible is that the creator was also our redeemer. That God always intended it that way. That deity would take on our humanity. He would pass the test that ultimately Peter, Job, Adam, and you and me really have failed. And he would indeed become one of us so we could become one with him. Let's pray. Father God, thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for your love for us. Thank you for letting us be the pinnacle of your glory, of your creation. Thank you that you fill us with your glory when we put our faith and trust in you, that you, you come alive in our spirit and we come alive in you and your glory radiates from us. Thank you for the hope you give us every day. Thank you that that tree of sin and death and shame and guilt and thank you that it's been pulled up and it's dead, that it's dying. May we not run there. May we feast over here at the tree of life every day. Thank you for being intentional. Thank you for being relational. Lord, thank you for this good day. In Jesus' name, amen.